Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and I'm a little frustrated. <laughs> so, I, this is one of those esoteric, um, uh, kind of driving Doug Ernst style uh, videos. And I could swear there was this picture I was trying to find, like I remembered it, I couldn't find it. And then the other problem is that Jim Shooter is so tall that he literally destroys the aspect ratio of like every picture he, he's in just becomes him. If you put it into 16.9, it's him and a bunch of heads. Uh, for Thankfully, I found one where he was leaning down to look at something, and then Stan Lee is in there for scale. I think Stan Lee is probably about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, uh, but then the other guy is just like a little bald head. I had to crop that out, but luckily the, the aspect ratio worked. It's kind of aggravated. I just spent like 30 minutes trying to find a good thumbnail for this thing. Um, but anyway, uh, this video came about because... I, I saw a, a little conversation um, on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> this wasn't MySpace. Um, and uh, Gregory Wright, who is uh, a colorist, he's been a colorist and a writer since the 80s. I, is, am I misremembering him as a, an editor too? Uh, I think colorist, yeah, colorist and writer. It was a conversation about Jim Shooter and his days at Marvel and why he was so controversial. Because I remember him being spoken of just like a freaking demon. Like when I got into comics mainstream, like, you know, like superheroes. Before I, I, I quit comics, I had just read like whenever like whatever, a movie, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, then toys, G.I. Joe, Transformers. I would buy those for like a year and then drop out. Although G.I. Joe was a couple years. Then I dropped out because of peer pressure, and I got back into comics like two or three years later. Um, but uh, uh, Jim Shooter was gone, so he would always be brought up. He was almost kind of like this Trump-like um, person in the industry. Like people just, oh my gosh, Jim Shooter, and like he never, like he, he would always be spoken of as if he was just like this absolute demon. But. Then the people would say things, and it didn't sound that bad. He's like, oh, he came in here, and he came into Marvel, and he established standards for covers. It's like, what? And he's like, and he said every comic was somebody's first comic. And I'm like, that's, that's true. I don't really understand it. So then, um, very simple words, um, uh, this uh, colorist, uh, he said... The problem was that it was cool to give, you know, a fairly strict set of guidelines to newbies. But Jim Shooter was also giving the same rules to people who were at the top. You know, John Byrne, Frank Miller, Walt Simonson, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz. And so it was very frustrating for them. That's why they would jump ship. Or um, uh, there's, there's kind of a different way. Um, uh, Frank Miller left. And he went to, you know, DC and Dark Horse and doing his own thing. Whereas Bill Sienkiewicz didn't leave, but he kind of stepped back. He's like, you know what? You know, miss me with this co-plotting, you know, being the main. I'm just, just give me just I'll just ink stuff. You know, it's mindless, busy work. So he would ink at Marvel, but then he would go do his more artistically satisfying stuff at, you know, other companies. Uh, he did like. What was it brought to light with Alan Moore and things like that? Um, so I thought that I was really, really happy to have a very calm, you know, uh, delineation of, of why he was controversial. If you were new and you're working under rules that were solid rules, every book is someone's, you know, uh, uh, first book. So you need to explain people, you know, explain who the people are, you know, why they're, you know, Drama is important and should draw you in. Uh, visually appealing, clear art, you know, uh, 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 understandable storytelling. Like, none of this is assailable. But then if you're Frank Miller and you've been, like, the top guy for, like, six years, he's like, yeah, okay, cool. I, I kind of break the rules. It's kind of my thing. I'm Frank Miller. So he's just like, whatever. I'm just going to go to D.C. again. Um, but uh, I really love this. And then I thought about something. I go, you know... When I came in, they had all these, you know, fanzines, uh, which were kind of like the news. I mean, they had Amazing Heroes, they had Comics Interview, they had uh, Comic Scene, they had Comics Buyer's Guide, um, and then later they had Wizard, 
and uh, Hero. Everyone forgets about Hero. Actually, Cartoonist Kayfabe does not forget about Hero. They, they, they mention them. Um, uh, but, and then when the internet came along, like all the print publications pretty much went away. I mean, there's still, there's the Jack Kirby, what is it called? The Jack Kirby Quarterly or something like that. Um, and there's other ones, but they're effectively dead. Um, but one of the things that was great about those days when things were so creative is that you could, with a very, you know, small amount of diligence of, you know, oh, I want to go read Amazing Heroes and I want to read this and that, you could not only understand the, the industry, but you could know the behind the scenes. You could understand, oh, there's this guy, Jim Shooter, he's at Marvel, yeah, sales are doing good, things are doing good, but there's some unrest. And then people would just talk about it in the interview. John Byrne would just be like, hey, yeah, I quit this one because uh, uh, Jim Shooter said this and then Bobby Chase said this and I quit. Now I'm on this other book because it's got a different uh, editor, but if he starts up, I'll just quit and go to D.C. And, uh, you know, you know, sometimes people did, you know, wait till they were out the door to. But things were fairly open. <laughs> people would just say what happened. I mean, I, I still haven't like read an interview where someone's like, Oh, I worked at uh, Marvel in 1983, and this is what... Like, the stuff that happened in Marvel in 1983 was being told in 1983. Sometimes early 1984. Same goes with 88, 90, 91. All through the 1990s, you were always finding out what happened. And then, you know, things were just kind of... It was, it was an understandable and examinable industry. I was going to put the... Uh, I looked it up. I believe it's Socrates. And an, 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 the quote is, "Un unexamined life is not worth living." But I thought if I put that as a title, somebody would take it as a suicide note. <laughs> it sounds like a suicide note. It, it could be misconstrued. You know, it's uh, as someone who doesn't like to own things, uh, and sometimes I go through big purges of uh, just giving stuff away. That's like one of the first signs of suicide. And I always have to tell someone, it's like, "Hey, do you want all of?" you know, this, do you want all of my books? And people are like, uh, they get nervous. I go, I'm not committing suicide. I just, I move a lot. I don't like to have stuff. I don't like clutter. Um, they're, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you're not killing yourself. Nobody wants a dead man's graphic novels. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, I was just thinking it, it was, it was like things were very open and it was, it was a, an industry you can examine, you could um, challenge you could say, oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. And it was very open that you could just be like, ah, whatever. I'm going to ignore you. Um, and now it's kind of like this horrible closed box. It's like this welded shut, you know, uh, safe at the bottom of the industry. And yeah, when people get fired or they quit and they're having a big tantrum, they'll, they'll, they'll put their company on blast. But even with all of those you know, uh, those people who put Oni on blast when they were, you know, cut during a merger, as all mergers lead to people being cut. That's the whole point of being of doing a merger is you're going to, you know, you're going to uh, double up the company, but then you're going to cut redundant personnel uh, and, you know, offices and things like that is they put on blast. But it was all just I'm trying to get people in trouble. Um, but there is no understanding of, you know, the the inner workings of Oni Press, a company who's been around for 20 years and you probably know almost nothing about them because it's very much of a closed industry. Now, the funny thing is that back in the 1980s, especially when, especially when you got John Byrne and Frank Miller and, you know, just really, really blowing up, selling hundreds of thousands of comics. And, and then, of course, the 1990s, millions of comics, Liefeld and all of them. It still wasn't a closed industry. It was a, still a place where you could go to, um, you could go to a uh, you know convention. You could go to a table and you could say, "Hey, Jim, this is what I think. This is what I think." And they'd always talk. Oh, I went to a convention, and this guy, you know, he bent my ear for twenty minutes about he doesn't like uh, 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 the uh, uh, what was it? The, there was this printing that they tried out like around nineteen eighty six, and it was really really bad for fine lines. So like uh, artists who put a lot of detail. The lines would just like uh, uh, they would drop out, or they would become like uh, very very thin, or uh, like they would break up. It wouldn't be a like a continuous line. So um, I remember that like you'd be like, oh, Art Adams is doing the Web of Spider Man annual, and then you'd look at it. It was called like Flexograph or something like that. Um, and then all like all of the people, 
Like, Art Adams would do an interview in 1987. He's like, I'm so frustrated. I'm working at Marvel and they got the flexograph and all, you know, all, it's destroying my art. They would just say it. Now, now the number one thing in the industry is consensus. It's fear and consensus. And nobody really says anything. They'll go, they'll go little, do little whispers to, uh, 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 Rich Johnson at Bleeding Cool, but Rich Johnson is is not anyone to help an industry. He's literally just a guy who likes, you know, it's it's like they say about Joker. He just likes watching the world burn. You give him some information, he's just going to use it to, to, to destroy a company, to destroy a professional's reputation. He just finds it entertaining. It's funny to him. But back then, you know, you had Amazing Heroes, you had Comics Interview. These were people who actually liked comics. And they loved the industry, and they loved the books, and they were very enthusiastic. Um, uh, so the idea about you know c- destroying people, there just wasn't. It's like being on a ship, and you hate the captain, and you hate the guy who works in the engine room. It's like this is the ship. I, we don't want to destroy him. Maybe you know the first mate needs to become the captain. Maybe the guy from the engine room he needs to go work in the you know whatever, be the lookout for people who fall overboard. But it wasn't about really destroying people. It was, it was like, hey, we like comics. We're really curious about working at Marvel. And the guy who works at Marvel is like, let me tell you about the flexograph process and how much ass it is. And then, you know, you know what? That problem didn't last forever. That problem lasted for about a year or so. And then they, uh, I think they, uh, uh, they did something at the printing press and you didn't find that issue as much and then you know they went to you know uh, different types of printing in the 1990s and then the quality became uh just so much better but i was just thinking about you know i've been in this you know i've had insiders but i gotta tell you it's like how would i describe it oh i know this is a perfect one if you're playing playstation 4 uh spider-man um, they have these, what are they? They're like the police communication towers. And you got to go around and you fix them. It's really easy. You just kind of spin the little handles, whatever. And it's weirdly satisfying, though. Like, it's really easy, but every time it unlocks, you're like, ooh, I'm a hacker. Um, but what it does is it has a map. And the map will, it's really, really vague. It has this weird kind of like static on it. But then when you open up that little beacon, all of a sudden, like, you know, Chinatown, it'll show all the streets perfectly like a map, and it'll show you where there's crimes, it'll show you where the little backpacks are. By the way, I'm calling shenanigans on the backpack thing. Everyone knows that Spider-Man's webs dissolve after a couple hours. Whereas here, he's like, hey, this is my backpack from high school. It's like, you're like 23 in this video game. I'm like, four, five, six years ago? And, And no one ever, like, went out there to smoke? No maintenance guys like well, there's just like this webbed up backpack. I'm calling shenanigans. That's sh- that's sh- that's that's what the video should have been about. Uh, by the way, I got to get back to that. Just as soon as I got free time, the TV broke, and I'm not gonna go to a store and buy something crazy. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, um, so that that's the analogy. You could read a couple of different interviews in Amazing Heroes or Comics Interview. And then you could be like, you could kind of understand the bullpen. No, the bullpen wasn't where the, you know, the pencilers sat and drew over the shoulder of, like, I actually thought, like, when I first heard about it, I thought, like, Larry Hama would be standing over the shoulder of the guy drawing that month's issue of G.I. Joe. And he's like, no, no, no. I thought Larry Hama was Italian because growing up in Nebraska, Hama sounded like an Italian name. So I imagine this, like, Korean war vet with, like, a beer belly and he's probably smoking a stogie. He's like, no, 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 no. You got to draw like this. And then the guy erases it and redraws. No, no. The bullpen was editorial. It was editorial. It was paste up. It was art corrections. When you see someone drawing, that's someone correcting a face that didn't look very good, a costume that wasn't drawn correctly, a character who actually can't be in that storyline, so he has to be switched out. Oh, we got Thor, but Thor is, you know, Thor is, um, he's in space right now, so change Thor to Hercules. And that's what they would do in the bullpen. But... Even after, you know, two, two and a half years and I have insiders, I just have little, little areas like, oh, I kind of understand why they made that decision. But there's still, it's, it's a blacked out industry. It, it, is, is, it is an industry, you know, they used to do, uh, uh, <laughs> this is the oldie Olsen stuff. Back in um, uh, World War II days, they would actually have blackout uh, rulings for like coastal cities. You couldn't, you'd have to, you know, put something, you'd either have to have 
no lights on in your house or you'd have to cover up the windows because the U-boat crews could spy on, you know, things like that. Uh, so it's a blacked out industry. It's, it's, it's an industry that refuses to be examined and uh, prides itself on not being understood. One of the things, you know, I, you know, I make educated guesses. I'll say stuff like, you know, uh, Mark Wade, uh, he's the one who hired, uh, he's the one who brought Kwanzer and Mags uh, to work at Humanoids. And then it'll come out later that Kwanzer was the first guy and then most likely he recommended, you know, uh, uh, Wade and uh, Mags. But then they always do this little, like, <laughs> you, know, you were wrong. It's like, well, ha- I'm making an educated guess about this weird, insular, scared industry. An industry that's based off of fear and consensus and lockstep. And just lying all the time. We got rid of Vertigo because uh, 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 imprints are confusing. No, no, no. If this was 1987, and there, okay, so I got to do a bunch of for instances. If, you know, Vertigo was a 1987 book, it would have been like this. Uh, Vertigo, there would have been an article in Amazing Heroes. Oh, you know, Vertigo uh, crumbling. And then it would have had whoever just quit or just got fired or even someone on the book. It would have had 1987 Ramon Villalobos saying like, yeah, things are really crazy. This books are pretty political and people don't like it. We're trying to figure out what we should do. We really don't understand. Hey, ask the, the, you know, the people reading this. And nobody would be like, Ramon Villalobos can never work at DC again because he said we were confused by low sales. No, they'd just be like, what, what, are, what are we doing? What are we doing? Tell us what we're doing. Ah, my boss is crazy. He made me put this... this Trump derangement stuff in there. I'm just trying to draw superheroes. Like, that's how they would actually talk in the interviews. Uh, it's healthy to talk about what's happening and admit your mistakes. I got a very good reaction when the Jawbreakers Lost Souls were damaged. And I said, hey, I screwed up. The shippers screwed up. We're going to make this right. How much would it help for us just, just not say anything? Ooh, it's... And then people have to confer. Hey, mine's kind of scuffed up. Is yours scuffed? Yeah, mine's scuffed up. Well, and then the other guys are like, mine's not scuffed up. Oh, what state are you from? Oh, I'm from West Virginia. Oh, I'm from West Virginia. Yours is scuffed. Mine's scuffed. What's going on? Nobody knows. It's just so much easier, you know. And uh, you know, if if uh, you know, we t- we talk about this. John Malin's like, I'm not drawing that. Healthy. It is healthy just to to be blunt and honest. Have that John Malin, Michigan bluntness and truthfulness be like yeah i'm not drawing that i'm not take that out of the script i like to have the old way i'm not drawing this and then when I, when i screw up i go eh, it's, you know screwed up you know and if anyone worked for me they're like you know uh hey you know i, I like zach but i didn't like his decision he made i wish he would have done it this way by all means um because that's how you get better that's why things are getting worse. Everyone's scared all the time. Everybody, oh, I'm not going to say anything. Oh, I'm so scared. I'll never be hired again. I talk to these people. They're like right on the bubble to work with me. Like a year ago, they're like, hey, I, I want you, you know, uh, I want to work with you, but I'm scared because I'm going to get blacklisted. And then the people who blacklist me are, are going to say there isn't a blacklist. And now I talk to them. I go, they're like, hey, I'm, I'm ready to jump on. I, I go, you know what? Just write it out. Just, just write out your next assignment and I'll still be here. And the thing is, it's basically, you can't really blacklist people in this industry anymore. There aren't enough steady jobs to blacklist. Before, you could be whatever, Dale Keown. You're, you say, okay, I'm going to, or, or Gary Frank. Is that the guy? Is that the guy drawing the Watchmen right now? It's Gary Frank, right? You know, he can, he can be working for Marvel UK, and then he's, he's on, uh, uh, what is he on? He's on Hulk for years and years and years. And then, what did he go to next? He was over at DC, he was doing Superman, now he's doing Watchmen. Like, he has... Like, he got in when it was honest and you could just talk. And now things are, like, blacked out, silent, and there, there's nothing to blacklist. There's no career. There's no 5, 10, 20 years in the future. That, all that stuff's going away. <laughs> like, there's a couple of years of, you know, th- what we have right now, and then it's going to split. It's going to be YA novels sold, you know, directly to schools and, and bookstores. And that's going to be very, very political. That's, oh, my gosh. Mm. And it's, it's going to be very much based on, you know, identity politics. And then there's going to be the prestige books. And the people who are going to get the prestige books, they already know it. It's going to be the Donny Cates, the, Johnny, the John, John Hickmans, um, the, uh, uh, 
I don't even think Ryan Stegman. It's going to be a bunch of uh, writers, and then it's going to be... Actually, it's not even predictable. So if you're an artist, you might as well jump ship because that ship is... At least your section of it is going down. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notification notifications thanks to everyone given to the gofundme and the indiegogo uh ethan van skyver he's got the uh the layout for the cover he's he just responded to me he's like i'm on it we're doing this so some people were asking am i gonna be able to see the ethan van skyver um uh because right now uh the kyle ritter variant is it's like four to one i've got no no it's like 4.5 to one so i've got like 4500 Sales on Ethan Van Skyver. I got 1,000 on Kyle Ritter, and but I think it's going to jump up. Um, when, not not throwing shade. This is friendly competition. Um, when people see the Ethan Van Skyver, you know, people want to see the cover. The plan was to have the covers before I started, and then I didn't do that. For Iron Sights Two will launch on October 1st. Uh, Secret Project will probably launch mm, November 1st, December, maybe November 1st. Um, uh, because Iron Sights 2 is going to be done, like done at, at the printer, probably before the end of October. No, no, I haven't told it by. I go, all your pages by the end of, uh, or by the, by the middle. I said, all your pages by Octo October 15th. He's like, no problem. We're at 76 right now? We only got 24 left. Um, and then it's all, it's all lettered. I letter it. As soon as I get the page, I letter it. So that thing, like he turns in the last page, I letter it. It's ready to go to the printer, like the next day. Um, we will show it to some people for uh, you know uh, edits and, and uh, peer review and that type of thing. But um, forget my tangent. Oh yeah, yeah. So when you see the Ethan Van Skyver cover, I'm sure there's going to be a big spike of people that were waiting to see it. So that's going to be fun. It's still open. It's on an in-demand store. It basically looks exactly the same. It's the same link. Uh, but anyway, thanks for uh, watching. And I'll have um, uh, what do I got tomorrow. I got the, what do they call that? True Believers? No, it's facsim facsimile edition of, I think it's the uh, X Factor with uh, Joe Casada and Peter David writing. That's a great, great, great issue. And then I got this really cool, um, it's like the Isle of Dr. Moreau drawn by the guy who drew Lock and Key. And I just flipped through that and that is friggin' fantastic. So I'll, I got those and then I'll probably do... Uh, uh, some back issues over the next two days until new comic book day. Thanks for watching. Bye.